It is my pleasure to welcome you to this talk that we are calling Blanca Ziska and the Knowing Body. I'm Marsha Ferguson from the Theater Arts Program at the University of Pennsylvania. Thanks for, uh, for joining us. This is a remote version of a talk that was originally planned uh, for um, March 25th. It was going to be live uh, on stage, but we are uh, responding to our current situation. I just want to take a small minute to thank the Theater Arts Program for generously providing for this artistic residency, and also especially uh, Noah Levine and Kat Johnson, who have been working very hard behind the scenes. It is my huge pleasure to invite uh, into this conversation Blanca Ziska, the artistic director of the Wilma Theater here in Philadelphia, um, internationally renowned director, theater artist, and the current artistic resident uh, for the theater arts program for, uh, for the current year. It's been wonderful to have her at Penn uh, in theater arts. Uh, she's worked with our students uh, extensively and um, been so generous with her, her time and, and continues uh, that generosity today. There's no better way to introduce Blanca than to uh, use a clip that someone else prepared. Um, in 2016, Blanca won the Vilcek Prize in theater. Uh, this is a prize um, that is awarded to an immigrant who has a legacy of major accomplishment in the arts and sciences and humanities. It's, um, it's a very important award. Uh, once a year, one person uh, in the whole world of uh, immigrants to the United States, and they prepared a lovely introduction. Let's have a look at this uh, clip from the Vilcek Prize uh, in 2016. The art of acting is transformation. Learning what it is to be other and become a bigger person through learning what it is to be the other. My name is Blanca Ziska and I'm the artistry director of the Wilma Theatre. I've been at the room almost 40 years. By the time I found Roma Project, it was an organization that had only $19,000 budget a year. I adapted Animal Farm and we put it on and we had to bring it back because it was sold out. So we went from you know, doing a play on $600 to do next one on $3,000. And then we did the next one on $10,000. And so it went like step by step like this. I grew up in a small town outside of Prague. The Russian invasion happened in 1968, but it took about four or five years before the government really imposed normalization. I became a member of experimental theaters that were kind of on the periphery of Prague. The scripts would be censored, but theater is an amazing place where you can actually talk to your audience through subtext. It was a huge gathering point for artists of all sorts because everything else was so censored. There was kind of a collusion between audience and artists. Every night something could happen and because of their excitement, the audience wanted to be there. Leaving Czechoslovakia was not easy. I found out three days before I left that I was pregnant. Yiri, who was my boyfriend at the time, and I packed our suitcases for a week. And we knew that we would not be coming back, but we didn't tell anybody because it was dangerous to talk about it. We got through and uh, got out of the train in Munich. In coming to the United States, I was shocked to 
experience the individual freedom that people had here. Yuri's passing was horrendously sad and disruptive. But at the same time, I started to feel free about exploring new things and going back in this belief that the art of theater has to be above everything else conceived and practiced by artists and the artists have to be supported. I decided that the Wilma will invest into talent by starting a company and invest into professional workshops. I've also decided that I really want to focus on Philadelphia, that there's now so many artists living in the city and it would be a shame not to help them to grow. If you have a group of people with whom you are actually researching their bodies, researching where the voice comes off, how the body resonates, how the voice resonates, what you are working on is creating an actor who becomes almost a material. I, I see 90% of them, they, they, they lost because they began to sing, they began to put words. In the United States, our playwrights write plays completely separate from theater. People who write texts, they should learn the language of a director. They should be working in the theater. I want the artist to be asking complex questions. I'm looking for a poetry metaphors, for uh, complicated questions about existence. That clip does such a nice job of economically giving us a sense of, um, of your origins. So I wanted to start off um, chronologically and ask you, Blanca, if you could- Hello, everybody first. <laughs> <laughs> so odd to do it this way, but- <laughs> Very odd, it's very odd, but yeah. we're, we're making it happen. That's the important thing. Yeah. Um, but. The, the, the historical photographs kind of um, just give the, the barest sense of what it must have been like making theater in Soviet-occupied Czechoslovakia under such oppressive circumstances. And I wondered if you might say briefly a little bit about what that was like for you, your very first experience with making theater um, in this context. Yes, no, so you can imagine I was very young at the time, you know, and uh, I, um, um, everything has changed within one day, uh, right? Suddenly you had on the radio, you w woke up in the morning and you heard at night that the tanks from Soviet Union and, and Poland and Hungary and East Berlin came to Czechoslovakia and we were, we were waking up to the sound of tanks basically and airplanes, you know, and everything changes within a moment. Uh, similarly to what we are experiencing now, everything has changed, right? Three weeks ago for us and we are kind of living in a different frame and that is uh, what happened then in a very, of course, different circumstances and different situation, but that sense of life changing completely was very clear, very clearly there. And, uh, you know, at that moment, people start making choices, how to survive, how to go forward, how to deal with the future. And, uh, you know, in theater, we believe that, um, theater is about action and through action of your characters that you are watching, you realize who these characters are. You are learning something about human nature. Well, when you are caught in this kind of historical change, you are learning a lot about human nature as well, about who we are and how we act in these crises, right? We can turn into diamonds or we can turn into ashes. And um, so that was very interesting to be inside of that and see how quickly people started to compromise about, you know, their original politics, you know, before the Russians, the Soviets came in 
and because there was a huge change, you know, in Czechoslovakia in in the middle of 60s, with, which was called the Prague Spring, very similar to what we used, what we called Arab Spring, that was actually taken after the Prague Spring, the Czech Spring, that that uh, uh, definition. So. Um, um, there was this sense of democratization and there was a huge new film wave happening. Theater was really freed from censorship. Lots of writers started to publish, being published. Translation of foreign literature was happening. So it was this amazing energy that suddenly came to halt. And um, uh, by the time I was about 19, that was maybe five years or four years after the five years after the invasion the what they called politically normalization which meant that everything was going back into the old stalinist kind of way of dealing with the world so basically you had to be loyal to the party and whatever the ideology told you that you are and you were you were meant to believe you had to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so you could see how people started to compromise and started to, in order to keep the job, staying at school, having some kind of future, started to kind of saying, yes, we believe in this ideology and we will do anything. And it's kind of that loyalty, you know, that, that we are seeing also a little bit in this country now, you know, with President Trump, who is looking for loyalty in, in the administration. Mm -hmm. That it was the same kind of, um, uh, same kind of a thing happening over there, loyalty to the Communist Party, which was really not what the Communist Party was supposed to be at the very beginning of the movement. It really became kind of this horrible bureaucracy led by these old men who were now 90 years old, you know, 80, 90 years old and really stuck. So uh, what uh, happened in theater was that there were small companies that uh, kind of remained nimble and on their feet, you know, and uh, this kind of underground theater that we created, young people, um, and we had to work um, basically that we would create a piece and present it somewhere for one day, like one evening, and then stop because second day, the second day the police would be there and they would find us doing this so we could not allow that to happen and uh, you know second day will not be happening anymore so again two months later there'll be a performance at some other place so and that's kind of how we were trying to survive for a while but of course everybody had to have jobs you know work in uh, support themselves so this was almost like amateurish kind of theater in a way even though for me that meant you know for in my life it was the focus of my life but um, it was all volunteering and basically, and, uh, and you were risking a lot. What was interesting about it, as I said in the film, is that the audience risked a lot too by going to the performances because police would be actually sometimes standing in front of the theater and looking at people who are coming in. At one point, what became very popular was the apartment performances that you actually did theater for 10, 15 people inside of your apartment. But even that, you know, was, was, uh, being watched and follow, you know, follow, followed by the police. So it was, it was, it could not last for too long, you know, and finally after like two and a, two years of doing this, we were, we were basically destroyed by, by, by the police. We just couldn't keep on doing it. Mm. Um, and um, um, that was kind of the end of it for me. Um, the one thing that was really fantastic was that at the same time, the theater situation in Poland was very different and the political situation in Poland was very different. And I was able to go every other weekend, take a train and to go to Poland, to Wrocław, which was close to the Czech border and see theater there and go there to festivals. And I saw, you know, living theater there and Peter Brooks work and Peter Schumann bread and puppet theater. So I saw a lot of theater and Grotowski and Kantor who were huge directors, international directors who were working from Poland. 
So I got to know their work. I took workshops there. And that was probably the biggest influence on me was this Polish experience more than the Czech experience. I remember yeah. you, we talked about this extensively and I remember you describing the sessions with Grotowski and how physically kind of brutal yes. they were. Um, and uh, it's, it, it, it was certainly something that I think has shaped and uh, influenced your work um, from the very earliest days. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that when we discuss the knowing body and hothouse, which is where, yeah. where you are now. Um, but great, thank you. Um, what I think we'll do now, and Kat, I, I think you're, you're poised for this, um, is just take a moment to show a whole bunch of production photos because nothing speaks to the kind of special aesthetic of the Wilma and to a kind of signature style if, they're, if we can talk about it that way. Um, like these, like these photographs. So uh, we'll take a moment now, Kat, if you are ready. Yes, thank you. And Blanca, feel free to chime in um, and name what we're seeing if you like. Um, but I think just this wash of images is going to be really instructive. So this is actually from a play that I wrote called Adapt. And it has somewhat autobiographical elements inside of it. It's about a woman by name Lenka, who uh, has this dream of arriving, being suddenly alone on stage in the midst of um, lots of uh, clothing, as you see. You know, <laughs> it was based on my on my experience when I first kind of uh, in Germany when I was living in Germany for a while. And I saw something like department store, which we didn't have in Czechoslovakia at the time. And I saw this pile of clothing uh, in front of me, you know, for five euros t-shirts and all that. I have never seen anything like this. And I almost got physically sick seeing so much stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, as you saw that in the first picture, the pile of clothing, there was kind of that uh, connection to that moment. Mm -hmm. um, this is... Um, so that was Adapt. This is from Angels in America um, by Tony Kushner that was done probably about eight years ago now. Um, we have created this kind of a metallic angels, fighter angels, uh, dark angel. Um, and uh, the whole theater was uh, architecturally a little bit restructured. So it looked like Wilma, but it was really not Wilma. Uh, and we painted it white, but kind of unfinished the painting so that um, with Perestroika, you know, that, that is the, the play ends up with that idea of that the work needs to go on. And so the set had this idea of kind of being unfinished. Mm. This is from Eurydice by Sarah Rule, the same author that you were working on, right? Who wrote Orlando. Um, and again, one of the things that we will talk a little bit about is these open spaces that are typical for my productions. Um, so this is when Eurydice comes into underground and there are three stones and I made out of them three clowns who are watching television all the time. Um, we had, for this production, we had original music. We had four singers on stage. Um, Toby Twining wrote music for it, and uh, it was very um, uh, kind of, um, it sounded almost electronic and manipulated, but it was not. He created everything with, uh, with the singer's live voices. So this is from uh, uh, Kill Move Paradise, a play written by local writer James Imes. And again, it's a huge space that you are seeing that these uh, actors are caught in that kind of take on colors like this. Mm -hmm. um, this is about uh, four black men who are find themselves in this kind of space, which is kind of a limbo. And we find out as the play goes on that they were all killed by the police and the sprinter prints out all the names of people who were killed in the last 17 years by the police. So that's happening throughout the production as the action 
continues. This is from When the Rain Stops Falling by an Australian writer, Andrew Bovell. And it is actually about ecology, about, yeah, uh, it starts in 2039 when the waters are rising and the world is, and keeps on raining all the time. And it connects family, kind of a destruction of family and destruction of ecology uh, makes these connections between both small family and the big world. Um, fish are falling from the ceiling, from the from the sky in the play. So yeah, um, that's still the same piece. And this is play called Outer Class, which was instrumental for me as kind of a prompt for starting a company. And I'll tell you more about it as we, when we once we start talking about, about Hut House, the company. But it is a play about uh, happening in 1941 in town in Poland called Jedwabne, which was on the border between the part that Germany during the Second World of uh, Second World War took out of Poland and, and Soviet Union. And when the Germans then in 1941 started the war with the Soviet Union, a lot of the Poles, the Catholics, uh, who were angry at the Soviets, because, uh, at the Jews, because uh, some of them were ideologically connected to the communism, they took revenge on the local Jews and killed all of them. And the, after the war, the um, the the Poles then said that it was Germans who killed these Jews in the village in the town, and that was the official truth for the next fifty years until two thousand one, when an uh, historian wrote a book about it, and it came out what really happened. The real history happened, and. Uh, created a huge, huge uproar in Poland. And this is from Tom Stopper, the play, that uh, Rosenkrantz and Guildenstern are dead, um, which we did about four years ago, I think, with the company already, is all members of the company who are working on it. Okay, and this is, this is probably a good time to segue back into um, a bit of conversation because, um, one this of the very things. first production of uh, Animal Farm that I that was mentioned in the movie, which we did uh, in 1979, I think. Yeah. First, your first production, I think, here in Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the things I wanted to ask you to to uh, tell us a little bit about um, is your relationship with Tom Stoppard, among other playwrights. Um, you've had some really rich collaborations with um, not only Stoppard, but Paula Vogel, Dial Oberlander Smith, um, and uh, Doug Wright, and uh, on and on, really. Um, but particularly Stoppard, I think there was, uh, of course, this uh, shared history. And you have premiered many of his um, most important plays. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your connection with Stoppard and what it's like to work with him collaborate in, a, in a collaborative relationship and, and also what those plays mean to you as a theater artist in your evolution. I think I have to first uh, thank Gary Mazer, who teaches at the University of Pennsylvania for introducing me to, for, to, to Tom Stoppard because Tom Stoppard actually was in residence at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, Carrie um, invited me and other artists who worked on Tom Stoppard's place to be in conversation with him to come to a panel. Um, and uh, because I directed travesties, Carrie invited me and uh, at that point, I have an accent, right? So everybody asks me where the accent is from. And once I said Czechoslovakia, Tom got very excited because he is from Czechoslovakian town where he's born, Zlin. And uh, he left when he was two year old boy, so he doesn't really speak any Czech, but he was very interested uh, for a long time in Czechoslovakia and was very helpful to some of the dissident writers 
had a very close relationship with Václav Havel, playwright, Czech playwright, who has then become president. Um, and so uh, that was the beginning of our relationship. And uh, we were already planning to open the theater, the new theater with Arcadia that Yiri was directing. And uh, Tom Stoppard agreed to come and visit us, to come to rehearsals. And we were at that time also organizing these, um, uh, these, these evening with writers, we call it Playwrights First, mm -hmm. and uh, invited many of, the, many of the writers, including Doug Wright and Tony Kushner and others uh, to different evenings to discuss, you know, what it means to open a new theater at, at the time, you know, and uh, so, so uh, Stoppard uh, participated in one of those discussions. And then Yeri has done many of his plays. I did less, I did, but I did uh, probably one of the more important for the Wilma, which was Invention of Love. Um, and then uh, I directed also uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead and The Heart Problem. I think those are the plays that I did, yeah. Um, but we did all together about 10 plays of his, yeah. Right, yes, it's a remarkable um, relationship, an artistic collaboration. And I, I love that your productions and Yiddish productions of, of Stockard's plays uh, achieved this emotional clarity underneath all that language, right? <laughs> and he's such a language playwright. Um, and I wonder if you would share with us the anecdote about, uh, that you've shared with me about during rehearsal for The Hard Problem, when you invited him into your, into your rehearsal process. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it, but I, I want to say that, you know, Tom uh, usually picks up a subject to write about because he doesn't know enough about it. And so his research has, is his way of learning. Right, so he, it takes him five years to write a play, but that's because he first reads so many books in order to learn about the subject that he wants to explore in the play. So that's the intellectual part of it. But then inside of, I think of uh, there, inside of him is also really a, a romantic, you know, and uh, I think his characters are also always searching for some kind of emotional connection. Mm -hmm. You know, in Invention of Love, you are looking at A. Alvesman, who seems to be such a distant and uh, difficult character to penetrate, but all his life, he was in love with Jackson, you know, who was a heterosexual man and he moved away to Canada to be actually as far away from Hausman as possible because love of Hausman was very difficult for him to deal with. But, you know, there was like unrequited love that Hausman was carrying inside of him for all his life. And that is so full inside of that play that is so present. And if you don't look for those kind of deep emotions inside of the, his texts, you can end up with a lot of speeches and a lot of intellectual text. But there is always, always an emotional side to his plays. So that's what I want to say first. And secondary, you know, Tom is always, you know, at the very beginning when I got to know him, he, he, you know, when actors, when he came to Arcadia rehearsal and actors would tell him, ask him, do you have some advice for us, Mr. Stoppard? And he would say, oh, just say my lines. That's all I care about, right? But then, and now I'm going to the anecdote that you are asking <laughs> to, to talk about, is that... Uh, as he came to the heart problem, I already was working with my company and we were doing one of the exercises that we do. And that is that the actors who now knew the scene did the whole scene in gibberish, in artificial language. So we are here. There is a, the most known playwright, you know, of <laughs> sitting in, in the rehearsal with us and we are doing completely... Uh, <laughs> You know, without any shame, the whole scene in gibberish. And he's sitting on the edge of his seat, endless eyes are popping out. And then he says, this was exactly what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. 
<laughs> and that just made me laugh because it yeah. shows you that at the end, words are important, but actually what is more important is what is the action, what is happening, what is, what is happening really underneath the words right so when we work with the actors what we do is we kind of work almost like as anthropologists or archaeologists i want want to say even more that we go from the surface from the you know from from the from the text that, that is already constructed to finding maybe something in the sound of the words and the construction of the sentences and we are trying to get it into our bodies through exercises first and that maybe takes us somewhere deeper into an emotion. So rather than imposing an artificial em emotions that we make up in our head and decide in our head what that could be, we are actually searching for it through more understanding the structure of the sentences and the sound of the words. That's a great place um, for me to sort of move in the direction that I'd, I'd like to next, which is uh, the creation of the hothouse company. Um, and, and we also get back to this term, the knowing body, which um, I sort of borrowed for the purposes of the talk um, based on our discussions. But certainly the work that you uh, did with my classes this semester earlier um, uh, really was a great experience for them in terms of uh, getting out of the head and into the body, and not just into the body, but into each other's bodies. Um, and uh, it was it was a very different and um, I would say a way of opening them to a, a whole new approach and perspective um, to making theater, to movement, and to sounding. Uh, and I wondered if if perhaps you would talk a little bit about. Um, we saw our class was a production that uh, in some ways uh, epitomizes the needs that you were feeling for the creation of a company. Um, and I wonder if you would talk a little bit about those needs and where, what Hot House is and how the, the technique, uh, the knowing body or the body that knows, and uh, I know you're still playing with uh, something to call this technique, but it, and it's still in evolution, you've brought other people in, the Greek gentleman whose name I can't pronounce. Um, what's his name? Do you mind? Sterzopoulos. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's it's a fascinating uh, evolution of something that's really quite new, mm -hmm. especially for the Philadelphia area. So I just wonder if you would speak to to Hot House. So uh, you know, it was my really came out of real personal need. I started to feel that I got stuck in this kind of the industry of the regional theater and uh, that the system that has been developed um, is serving the business of the theater but not the art of the theater. And uh, that in that business, the artists are the last people to really take take care of or you know the theater is not home to them mm -hmm. they have to audition to get to work in the theater they have to be liked you know by the casting director by the director i don't know by you know by whom you know they there is this whole system of like okay we all have an opportunity we are all at the bottom and maybe we can crawl up to the top you know on that pyramid right and uh, I felt that um, also for me, every time I'm starting a rehearsal, I'm starting now with new people that I'm casting, you know, um, for, for a production. And uh, that I'm starting everything from scratch again, again and again and again. And uh, that it takes for about a week or 10 days for people to even lose the fear that they bring with them, you know, do I look right? Am I good enough? Do I get respect from other people? All these questions that are embedded in actors' brains, right? And they don't allow them actually to put themselves in and into the depths of the work. It mm -hmm. takes you away. All these questions takes you take you away from the actual work. And uh, 
uh, and that there is nothing like a continuity, you know, in the theater, in American theater, because it's always new faces, uh, because we are, we were auditioning by type, you know, I ne need this kind of type into the play. You write two or three sentence description of what that character is, the reduction of the human, you know, largeness into three sentences of what this character should be is crazy because from that very beginning you are starting to reduce the humanity of the character right as soon as you put adjectives on it this is the you know and 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 uh, so so that was something that i was struggling with and i found it really empty and uh, difficult for me to continue even I, I was at the, at, at, the, at, at the moment when I was thinking I'm either going to leave theatre altogether or I need to change it. Mm -hmm. And so that was the impetus for it. Um, the other thing was um, that um, I felt, feel that um, uh, why do we do theatre? You know, why does one do, wants to do theatre is, you know, that's what we had in Czech a long time ago in Czechoslovakia that we had a company and that company together had a, some kind of a persuasion about what it means to be on stage, what it means to be with other people in a room and telling a story to them or to each other. And uh, that for that, we needed to have a sense of who we are as a collective. Mm. And you cannot have a collective when you are auditioning people individually for each of the projects, right? So that's the other thing. And the third thing was that theaters are, you know, paying and taking care of administrators financially, but they are not taking care of the artists. The artists are freelancers. They are getting job. They are getting paid for, you know, seven, eight weeks of the run and then they let go. So that's the other thing that I'm trying to figure out how to how to make that happen. It's now with the situation right now, I'm so much worried about all these freelancers because many of the actors are living between being waiters and between performer and those jobs are gone, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, so so those are kind of the three impetuses that I had my own, my own, you know, need, um, the need of uh, kind of, uh, making sure that the actors are inside of a collective, working inside of a collective, a company, that there is a connection, um, human connection, but also that we get to know about ourselves through the work with others. Because I don't think you can really know your characters unless you get to know you know you learn to know about yourself through knowing through learning about others um so yeah and the th and the third one is like how to how to keep on these actors to help them to uh to keep on learning you know because i think that's one of the basic things in life you know that i myself i want to keep on learning and i think actors so many times are just waiting for the next job and they don't have anything else to do because it's very difficult to keep on acting on your own when you are not at work, right? So what do you do in between the jobs? So, so you've given them freedom, actually. You've, you've, you've uh, given them a comfort and the freedom to um, not always please necessarily, not always uh, to have the security to explore. To give, it, to give it a space to experiment, you know. Exactly, and and that's where uh, maybe we can start talking about a bit about the technique that that is evolving at Hot House. Um, uh, is there anything you'd like to say about the technique itself? Uh, a lot of it, it it does about about really more about how to make the body completely flexible and alert, alert body. Right, and uh, it connects a lot with work with the voice inside of the body. Um, and the work that we have been doing is based on a- um, yeah, These are, I'm sorry, Blanca, can you, we're, I just wanted to say this is, these are some stills from a very recent residency that Blanca did in uh, Prague, where yeah. she introduced some of these uh, techniques to actors there. 
Right. So uh, the idea is coming from a uh, actually a German uh, Jewish German um, teacher, Alfred Wolfson, who uh, was born in the 19th century and then during the First World War, he was working as a nurse in uh, in the war in the field, and he was actually separating the dead bodies from bodies that were still alive. And what he was struck with was with the sounds that were coming out of people's bodies at that time, you know, at the time of hurt. And uh, he actually was suffering afterwards with uh, with uh, kind of PTSD and was hearing these voices in his head. And he started to cure himself by studying by studying voice, mm. and uh, was actually kind of imitating and learning how to create these voices that were so unusual that he heard. Um, and uh, out of that came his technique, you know, that um, then was developed further by actually Artaud and uh, Grotowski, um, Roy Hart in France, and also uh, Jean René Toussaint, who was working then with the company. Um, I brought him to Philadelphia, and for about two or three years, we were able to get from Knight Foundation funding to support workshops in Philadelphia for actors. And actors were paid to take the, when they were taking these workshops. Normally you pay for a workshop, but here actually actors were paid seven, $700 a week to take part in the workshop. And through these, through, these two, through these two or three years, I think we got to about 120 actors in Philadelphia. And that was the beginning of the company. Out of this, these people, then I chose 14 people to become part of the Hut House. Mm -hmm. And um, the work is very much based on this idea of create, creating fluidity between emotion, voice, and movement. And uh, the idea is that we are not teaching the actors anything, and that's kind of what why it's called what the body knows, is that you you have the information that the body has the memory inside already. We have just created, you know, through our our culture and civilization, we have created these obstacles that prevent us from using our body fully. And so the the trick is for us to break through these barriers and and rediscover what is there mm -hmm. so um, you know in voice alone i think we discuss in our work the idea that there are we have inside our body all these different voices but our culture teaches us to use this social voice, which is very much a voice that is kind of nice and pleasant, doesn't insult anybody, doesn't provoke anybody, right? But it's not a great voice for the actor because it ends up, uh, doesn't, doesn't give you the possibilities to explore all the, you know, all the, all, 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 all the different situations that we find ourselves in. And, uh, you know, the, the terror or the beauty of life, right? So um, those are the kind of exercises developed to discover and explore, to find these voices inside of our body. And when you are discovering these voices, how does this shape your body? How does this voice, this energy that's coming from the voice and from the breath, how does it shape the body? Or if the body is creating a shape, how does it influence the voice? So creating this fluidity, right? And how out of that can be born, an emotion can be born. Right. Instead, again, imposing an emotion, imposing, you know, deciding intellectually, oh, I'm now this character is angry. Well, when character is angry, you can also suddenly feel victorious or sorry for something within that anger. Yeah? Or you can through that anger start to love somebody, right? And there are all these possibilities. Like you can move through all this. Emotions is something that is in constant motion. So we are working on this flexibility and this motion of emotions. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of maybe how I would speak about that. Yeah. Thank you. That's a that's a lovely overview, um, and certainly having uh, experienced uh, a workshop like situation in in our in the classes uh, that you visited with my students, 
um, it all it, it contextualizes very well what happened there. Um, just before we we move on to the question and answer part of of our discussion here, I wonder if you would just bring us all up to speed on what's happening at the Wilma now. Um, some very interesting changes are happening, um, especially at the level of leadership um, of the uh, artistic directorship of the Wilma. So just take a few moments, if you will, and yeah, 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 that's very interesting, and but really it happened only because of the hot house. You know, because with the work of the hot house and uh, the company is racially mixed, you know, it's uh, and uh, also H Y is mixed, you know, and so and because we are working with the body and uh, there is always a intimacy that works because we are with our palms, our hands, we are supporting each other bodies. So you put your palm on somebody's back and then send your vibrations of the voice through the palm of the other person, you know. So you are creating these intimacies very clearly, very quickly. And with that really almost naturally comes trust. Mm -hmm. So we have achieved through this physical work something that is actually very difficult to achieve in today's environment and that is trust among the members of the company. It takes time, but it, you know, it's taken some time, but there is really pretty incredible trust within the company. And out of that tr trust comes collaboration. Um, and uh, we were, I was just thinking, how can we bring that that those values that we have developed in Hot House, how to bring it to the leadership of the organization. And uh, because also um, what is important in, uh, you know, very much important uh, for, for, for all of us in the company is that, you know, all the actors can bring their voices into the room and uh, uh, that they are, the voices are represented in the room, right? And so there was a question also about what do we do, you know, with the in the future, in the leadership. And so out of that came that idea that there should be more than one artistic director, which was something that we all have been doing for the last 30, 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. So we were, uh, I was um, very interested in working with directors who were a part of the company somehow or experience working with the company because we decided that the hot house is going to be kind of the soul of the Vilma and that the artistic directors need to buy into it and be intimately connected to, to hot house. Mm -hmm. So the two people that were completely, you know, um, just because they were already part of it, uh, were very clear choices where James Imes, who was actually as an actor at the very beginning members of the member of the company, but then he could not attend our Monday sessions because he was teaching at the University of Illinois on Mondays. And Yuri Urnov, who is a Russian director who now lives in Baltimore, teaches there uh, in Towson, I think, University, and um, was directing Mr. Burns at the Wellman, spent a lot of time at the Hot House leading some of the sessions. So there are two very clear, clearly good directors who the members of the company knew very well. And, uh, and then I was looking for a young woman because I felt like I needed somebody who is really from a different generation because both James and Yuri are around just 40. And uh, so I wanted somebody younger and I was really looking for a younger woman. And then, that took me a long time because I needed to uh, invite people. These, uh, you know, I had about 10 people that I invited to work at the hot house to lead sessions so that the artists would get to know them. Then I needed to, the other directors to get to know them and all that. So it took a lot of time, but we end up with Morgan Green, who seems to be really terrific mm -hmm. from the, uh, the last four months that I've been working with her now. So here we are. It's going to be a cohort of four people. This is my last two or three months of being the artistic director. I will never be the artistic, the only, own, own, mm. the only artistic, the one artistic director ever again. That's it. Um, I'm now going to be a co-artistic director for the next three years uh, with this uh, cohort, and then we'll see what will happen then. So we are looking at this also as an experiment and we'll be discussing it, analyzing it as we go and decide only later on, like maybe in the end of the second year, what is the next step after that, after the three years will go by. Well, it's, uh, 
it's such an exciting moment for the Wilma and um, for for your audience as well, uh, because there's a, <laughs> a lot that's new that's coming up, I'm sure, and um, and yet the continuity of the company um, sort of balances the experimental quality of of breaking up uh, and reunifying in this very uh, um, collaborative way. You know, yeah. the company and the actors are getting voice into, you know, managerial things that, you know, actors normally do not have mm -hmm. any, any participation in, right? Yeah. 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 It's another way. It's, it's, a, it's a remarkable moment for the Wilma. Um, thank you so much, Blanca. This has just been fascinating. Uh, I wanted to open it up now to some questions and see if anyone has anything specific that they wanted to, uh, to ask you. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to you, Kat. Uh, Kat is, is the technical whiz behind this event. Um, Kat, are you? Yeah, I will talk to you uh, how we're gonna do this Q&A. So thank you all for being here. Uh, you've been muted and uh, your video has been off. Thank you for that. What I would like everyone to do, if you'd like to ask a question, is to raise your hand. So I'm gonna tell you how to do that. Along the bottom of this screen, there should be a uh, icon that says participants. If you click on that and open it, you'll get an option to raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, um, I will then look through the audience and see who's got their hand raised. If you don't want to speak out loud, um, then you can go to the chat, which is another icon along the bottom and open that up. And you can chat to either everyone or to Noah Levine privately and he'll let me know that there's a question out there um, of someone that doesn't want to speak. You are allowed to turn on your video while you're um, asking the question if you'd like, but you don't need to, you will be recorded. Um, and then you can turn your video back off again. So if anyone has found their raise hand button and wants to ask a question, go ahead and start raising your hands and I'll call on people as I see them. All right, Jane, uh, I'm gonna call on you. You are now unmuted and you can ask your question. <laughs> Hi, um, it's lovely to see you. Uh, in the 80s, I took an acting class at the Wilma Theater, and I think it was during the summer, but it, it was really a, a, a great opportunity for me as a young actor. Uh, it was divided into like four different sessions, I believe. There was one that was dialects. Um, there was another section that was taught by, I believe, Marcel Marceau's assistant. So we did a lot of mime. And um, I think Gordon Phillips was also involved in it somehow. And I was wondering if you were um, going to pursue something similar to that in the future for young actors in the area. Thanks. Yes, I'm, I'm very interested in expanding a way of sharing, you know, what I have learned over the years and uh, I'm just trying to figure it out. We are actually offering, we you know, every year now for the last three years, a three week long intensive where we are teaching the method of Terzopoulos, Theros Terzopoulos, the Greek directory that we have all started with. I have been sending our actors to his company to work with his company in, in Athens. And he was here to work on an Antigone, uh, on the production of Antigone with his Greek and Philadelphia actors, the hot house actors. Um, and uh, then I am teaching there Sarah Glico, who is amazing uh, voice teacher, is teaching uh, kind of the method that we are working with, but in singing. And uh, we have also somebody leading a contact, then contact, contact improvisation as well. Um, so um, there is this three week session that we do, but I would like to especially now that I will be working for the Wilma starting next season, only half time, I will have time to focus on teaching, which I really want to do. Uh, that's also one of the reasons why I want to get away from the administration so I can do more of that work. So yes, um, you know, we would have had another, uh, another uh, uh, intensive in June for three weeks, but that obviously needs to be postponed now. Um, as soon as we can get back together into the rooms and breathe at each other and sound at each other and hold hands and give hugs, we'll be doing the classes. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Jane. 
Um, All right, Jennifer, you are now unmuted. Hi, thank you so much for this really inspiring talk. It's so wonderful to, to hear you. Um, I wanted to ask if you had any, um, how the woman was sort of navigating the current crisis and if there's perhaps anything we can learn from sort of historical crises, thinking about making underground theater in, the, in, in Czechoslovakia, or is, is there anything we can learn from those sort of periods of crisis about how theater might be responding now and what its place can be now? Right. I mean, that is really, for me, a very interesting question. I just had this morning a virtual session, four and a half long session with my actors, right? Um, and uh, uh, it's, you know, with what we are talking about, right? It's like suddenly everything has changed and we are now in a different frame, inside of a different frame. And the question is now, how can we be creative and staying in contact with our audiences during this time. And uh, I don't have any answers for it because we are all just uh, experimenting, starting to experiment with it ourselves. You know, my first impulse was um, starting to read out loud the poem that I directed um, this fall there in the light and the darkness of the self and of the other by Etel Adnan, who is a Lebanese philosopher, poet, essayist, novelist, but also wonderful visual artist. And uh, the poem just because she wrote it after, during or after, she wrote it in San Francisco, actually in California, but she was, over, she was always dealing with uh, the, uh, with the consequences of the civil Lebanon, civil war in Lebanon, where where she's from, and the kind of the um, um, so so anyway, I was I was feeling very strong that that poem because it's exploring these changes and and questions consciousness and questions who is the other and if there should be the other it was an interesting piece to maybe share with the audiences in a very different way than we did on stage in the fall. So I started to experiment with that. Then we are talking about, you know, how to read the sessions in the hot house. And, uh, you know, what we are doing right now, we are working on Terzapolos uh, work, uh, training which is very structured almost like yoga or a, or any um any any classical you know um like judo or, you know it has very strong structure right and so it's easier to do that so what is great about it that though even though we are not in the same space with all the actors we are still in the same time and that sense of company can be extended even this way, even though we are not in the same room. And it feels very emotional to actors and it gives them a lot of hope. And um, the other thing that we did today was just working with voice and uh, breathing and sounding, sending our voice to different surfaces in the room that we are all locked in, right? And learning about the room in a different way than we have had in the last three weeks, you know. And uh, that was very emotional for the actors too, kind of the rediscovering of objects and, and uh, walls and material that surrounds you and you are not paying really attention to it. But if you, if you actually sent your voice and notice the vibrations and how they change depending on the surface. Um, it was giving them something that was, that was, uh, it was giving them joy, which is I think really important thing to have happen mm -hmm. at this moment. We are talking about, you know, how we will not be able to do the production as God is that's supposed to happen at the end of May, beginning of June. But we really do want to invest into our actors and help them to survive, you know? So we want to do the production. We'll do the production without the audience. We will create it 
inside of the empty theater. So instead of creating the set, the empty theater will become the set for the play. And because Is God Is is about these two women kind of traveling through United States almost, it's a story of revenge. We will have them traveling through the theater, through the empty rows of the uh, of the theater seats, you know, um, and stuff like that. So, and we'll be filming it um, and then and then showing it the audience in this version. Now, of course, we have to deal with lots of real little obstacles like unions, you know, and getting the permissions and getting the rights from the author to have it done this way. So there's a lot of step to be taken. But this idea of um, of using the situation that we are in, which is the empty closed theater, and hopefully at the time when actors actually can come together, we can have 10 people together in a room, that we may try to do that that way. Because I think we will be able to do that before audiences will be able to come to theater. So those are the kind of creative ways of trying to deal with it, you know, to but I also, also think that what is really important, what I realize that I am constantly like managing the situation because I'm still the artistic director and that I am letting myself very little creative time for myself, you know? And that's a danger in this because we are constantly adapting to the new set of circumstances and navigating those. And so we are managing our time. But I think it's very important to just really take 30 minutes and write whatever comes into your head, into your journal, right? Go for a walk. You know, I love that what the last play that we, uh, that, that we did was called Describe the Night. And it was based on Isaac Babel, who is a writer, and he gave himself always this prompt, describe whatever is in front of you, just describe it. And he was doing that. And I think stuff like that, giving ourselves, allowing ourselves time to do that is really way forward so that, uh, that we are not just consuming information because that can get very depressing. That's, that's a great prompt for, for our students as well and who are so valiantly dealing with this yeah. uh, sudden remove that, uh, that we're all experiencing. Um, but giving yourself time to be creative is a wonderful reminder. Yeah, and thank you for that question, Jennifer. That was lovely. Great. Yes. Kat, how are we doing on uh, questions? I know that we're running a little over the time that we'd allotted. I can explain hand raising again, or if this is a time. <laughs> it's been a rich hour. We can, uh, we can cap here. We can. Uh, are there any other questions? And if you're new to Zoom, look again at the, your bottom, there'll be a participants place, you click that, and then that will give you an option to raise your hand. Um, but if I don't see any hands in the next couple seconds, uh, oh, I do see a hand. Maybe it was just someone experimenting. There we go. Tias, uh, you are now unmuted. Thank you. Um, Blanca, you've had some really fantastic insights into the ways we can keep working as we're in this uncertain time. I was wondering, what are some of the things, having taken your training, it's so implemented in the physical, having that had that wonderful opportunity to work with you. What are some things that for you, you're really looking forward to get back into the same space with the actors because you just can't quite do it the same way with the screens? Oh, like oh, everything just, you know, like you cannot feel the energy, you know, like uh, that energy that goes from one body to another, you know, that is just so beautiful and important, you know, and you, you, you don't really see the body language, you know, like we have conversation with words, but we also have conversation with the body and that, that, that is missing. You know, we are looking at our screens all the time now, but it's, it's, you know, people nod, right. And I like agree with you, but it's like that subconscious that is not being revealed completely, you know, um, the work that we do is, uh, you know, that just uh, being able to be back with back to another person, you know, and sending our voices to each other, just so beautiful. Um, and so giving that sense of generosity that comes from people when they are not afraid and uh, um, to give. 
and to take because sometimes taking is more more difficult than giving uh, is what I'm missing a lot. Um, you know, I'm in a very kind of interesting moment because uh, I have been not living with my son now for a long time. He has been outside of, you know, you know he's 40, right? He's older than you, you all are. And, but I am now like for the first time in years again in his place with his girlfriend. So I am like suddenly in the middle of a, my little family, which I have not had that experience for a long time. So I'm really trying to enjoy that as much as I can. Um, but um, so that, that is, you know, I feel like we can always find something, something, at least in this world, we still can find some like, beautiful, beautiful things in life. You know, I, when I was in London, I just came from London three weeks ago only, and I went to see Tom Stoppard's play, Leopoldstadt, you know, and uh, that is uh, something about Tom Stoppard, he's Jewish, and uh, but he was brought up totally as an English boy and his mother didn't want to really talk about anything, about the history and anything. So he never asked any questions and only after his mother died, he kind of gave, gave himself permission to explore who his family was. And he found out that most of them were killed in Auschwitz. And uh, this play is really, is about, um, a family of Jews living, uh, I think the place starts like around 1925, if I remember correctly, and goes all the way to 1950, maybe 1890, and goes all the way to 1950. Uh, and it's this very, you know, powerful family, very vibrant family that ends up with only two survivors left in 1950s. And I was just thinking about, you know, how even with these horrible things that we have now in the virus, you know, that we still are not afraid of walking out of the door, out of the door, thinking that, you know, this walking out of the door is taking us to Auschwitz. Um, and uh, so I was thinking this virus of nationalism is even worse than this biological uh, virus. So, you know, I'm from Eastern Europe, so I'm always saying to myself, this is the culture that we come from. You know, it can be worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love that question, Tias. And um, I remember so well your work with Blanca in the class. Um, I loved your work, Tias. You are so, so open to it. Yeah. You just were like a little flower, just pulling it in, pulling it in. Um, and so I think uh, this, this is a great place to wind up because once again, we're talking about the knowing body, right? And how this is what we miss as theater artists is being in each other's presence, yeah. making the work happen through this collaborative impulse and this you know, mutual respect for what happens when, uh, when we are trusting each other uh, and the work. Um, I think the main thing I would want to say is let's not focus on our losses. Let's focus on what we can create out of the situation that is positive and constructive and creative. Yeah. Wonderful. And uh, what a great place to, to wind up. Thank you so much, Blanca, not just for this time, but for all the time that you've given us so generously. Thank you everyone who uh, joined us today and special thanks to you, Kat and Noah, for uh, steering us through. Absolutely. Uh, everyone can feel free to leave the meeting now as uh, you would leave an auditorium and uh, we'll just keep the space open until uh, everyone is gone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're Blanca. getting some clappings if you're not seeing that on your stream. <laughs> no, I don't see that. That's nice to know. <laughs> yes, there's clapping. And people have figured out how to turn the clap on and off, so they're actively clapping. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Thank you.